Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this historic occasion. No, this time we are not with King John and the Barons. We are not sealing Magna Carta. Something even more momentous than that is happening in front of our very eyes in Egham. This is the first digital talk presented to you by the very own and wonderful Egham Museum. Welcome. Thank you all for attending. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function and uh, and let me know where you're watching from and uh, how you uh, heard about the event. I hope you're all well. Um, I better introduce myself. I'm the digital engagement officer, so I'm the person that you see. Well, there you go. They've got the banner it says that says who I am. Um, it's always a great sign when you start talking and four people drop out immediately. So uh, I won't take that too seriously. Anyway back to tonight's proceedings as the uh, title of the event suggests um tonight we are talking about the commemoration of magna carta and this is not a talk like any other no 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 we are not simply talking about history tonight we are talking about magna carta the way it's been commemorated and how we might use the museum collection um to tell that story i'm going to wait for a couple of minutes before uh, before I do make a start. But in the meantime, that gives me a lovely opportunity to, uh, to start selling some merchandise. So for instance, um, obviously this talk is free, um, but we would very much, Jenny Pollock, yes, I am Mr. Twitter. Um, yes, so obviously this talk is free, but we are a charitable organization, uh, independently run. And we rely on the generous support of funders and uh, public do donations. So uh, either there are two options, uh, should you wish and you feel satisfied by the quality of tonight's talk, then please feel free to donate um, using the using the link that's handily popped up on screen. Geez, this is like presenting the weather. I quite like this. I could get used to this. Um, if not, then uh, we have a wonderful Saray, Saray, array of uh, merchandise in our uh, Egham Museum store, which was launched only the, at the end of last year. So three different mugs, two Magna Carta themed with King John, um, one for uh, one for the coffee drinkers and one for the uh, tea drinkers out there. And if you're not into uh, King John, but you are into supporting the museum, we have the the original Egger Museum coffee taste better with friends mug. Um, so any any um, sales will be greatly appreciated. Likewise, any donations also greatly appreciated. So I'm going to wait one more minute which means that you're going to have to listen to me bumble on for another minute. So apologies. If at any point you'd like to uh, tell me to be quiet, then just do use the handy chat. Um, please keep the rude words to a minimum. I'm trying my best. Um, I suppose I should probably say that because we are a small independent museum, um, we have a small army of hamsters in a hamster wheel currently powering the internet. And every occasion um, they have to take a little break, um, which means that the quality of the internet signal can go in and out. So if at any point I resemble Pac-Man or a pixelated blob, um, bear with us, um, the hamsters are just taking a little break. We're up to 17, which means I'm in nosebleed uh, territory. Um, also, just, just for reference, this isn't how the museum is currently, or isn't, is always decked out. Um, we managed to pilfer these off the barons in 1215 and we've looked after them ever since. Um, no, I'll talk about the uh, the backdrop a, a little later on in the talk. 18 people, wow. Right, so without any further ado, I've done enough filler. You are, are about to be wowed by Egger Museum's first um, digital talk on the subject of commemorating Magna Carta. If, uh, if there's anything that I uh, hope that you will take away from tonight's talk it's the fact that if should anyone ask you where was magna carta signed you will a tell them that it wasn't signed it was sealed and then b immediately follow up with at the bottom dad jokes are free right just a short talk shouldn't take me a couple of minutes or hours um i'll try to keep it as quickly as possible so commemorating magna carta at runnymede as the uh title of the talk suggests. Uh, the focus of tonight really relates to Runnymede, the site on which bad King John famously sealed Magna Carta in 1215. There we are, the romanticized image of King John. That's probably not what uh, Runnymede looked like in 1215. 
fact, it's definitely not what running mead looked like in 1215. Uh, don't think they had a gazebo um, uh, erected at running mead, but um, nobody really knows. But that's a very highly romanticized and very civil uh, depiction of what Magna Carta and the ceiling looked like in 1215. Um, so, yes, it, it, Runnymede is a site where. Uh, where Magna Carta was famously sealed at the uh, behest of his revolting barons and the commemoration of this moment across the 20th and into the 21st century. So despite the Charter's 13th century origins, the commemoration of Magna Carta does not have as long a history. And indeed, as we will see at Runnymede, we can probably talk of a commemorative tradition that spans roughly a time frame of only 100 years. So because of time, that was smooth. Like I thought I'd finished the end of that, but I've literally only finished the first paragraph. Apologies, I'll get better. So because of time, this talk will not be able to provide a complete history of commemorations at Runnymede over the last hundred years. Instead, it will focus on some of the key moments, drawing out these using Egger Museum's very own fine collection as the vehicle through which to talk and engage with these commemorative moments. Secondly, and perhaps this is an obvious point, but the ceiling of Magna Carta has two key accessible points or points of entry, shall we say. One, 1215 left physical engrossments. So there are four surviving 1215 copies of the charter. And secondly, we have the site Runnymede where it was sealed. So any commemoration at Runnymede is therefore a commemoration of what we might call an intangible heritage. That is to say that nothing from 1215 remains visible to this day. And perhaps I would say is this intangibility that has allowed people to view, interpret and celebrate the anniversary of the charter in numerous different ways. So this is, um, this is our first profile of uh, an a, a, uh, item from our collection. Here we have a map of Runnymede from the 1930s. Runnymede being bottom left um, and a more picturesque view, courtesy of the National Trust. Um, this is the site on which we currently have all of the uh, memorials built. Um, so I, I recommend you go onto the National Trust website if you'd like to look at that map in more detail. So the history of Magna Carta, the ceiling of Magna Carta at Runnymede in 1215 has become an iconic moment in English history, or at least an Anglo-centric account of British history. I think we uh, you know, should always be aware that in 1215, it was very much England and Scotland separately. Um, and therefore, maybe Magna Carta is best termed as an English, uh, an English document rather than a British document. However, you know, that's a conversation for a different talk. Magna Carta was designed to avert civil war. In its time, it was a complete failure and it was an old no sooner than it had been sealed. The charter, however, endured. To this day, its ceiling continues to hold a form of cultural resonance, and one only needs to turn our attention back down to the lockdown of November 2020 and the appeals to Clause 61 of the 1215 Charter to underline this point. So its legacy has been protean, characterised by its capability to lend authority to the causes of both radical reformers like Francis Burdett and John Wilkes, or more establishment figures such as the 17th century jurist Sir Edward Cook, to the likes of even Conservative MP David Davis. Perhaps the pithiest summary of Magna Carta's history was made by the medieval historian James Clark Holt when he describes its legacy as the history of an argument. And from a 21st century legal perspective, Magna Carta is redundant, devoid of any practical utility which would appeal to the Charter motivated more by a desire to hit the headline. So at its simplest, the Charter has come to represent two key ideas, I would say. Firstly, the supremacy of the rule of law and the freedom of the individual would be secondly. The movement of 1215 um, is framed as the defining moment in which a tyrannical ruler was held to account by the people and made to accept the superiority of, of the law of the land. It is these two overarching ideas that continue to energize Magna Carta, providing it with a certain level of contemporary currency 
and popular appeal. And for the most part, it is this commitment to these broad ideals that are reaffirmed during commemorative moments. So we go from 1215, fast forward to 700 years to 1915. So in 1915, um, really represents a key moment in which the legacy of this charter could be suitably commemorated. Um, the charter's 700th anniversary in 1915 was obviously overshadowed by the First World War, but prior to the outbreak of fighting, plans for a national celebration had been mooted, rather unsurprisingly. At the heart of this was the Royal Historical Society, who had established the Magna Carta Commemoration um, Committee in early 1914. One of the proposed events was a visit to Runnymede where an address on the spot of Magna Carta's ceiling was proposed. Beyond this, however, there was no mention of any commemorative plans taking place at Runnymede. Locally, the anniversary was only mentioned in passing within the pages of the Surrey Herald. And it's really only noteworthy only for its, uh, its humorous levels of historical inaccuracy. It states, 700 years ago, one of the fickle Stuarts was met by that bold band of barons. So I think that really says quite a lot about the you know, levels of historical literacy that were in Egham 105, 106 years ago, to the fact that they managed to confuse the Stuarts with the Plantagenets. So at the turn of the 20th century, oh wait, actually. So the point I'm trying to make is that in 1915, Runnymede hasn't changed. Um, Runnymede, beyond the fact that you know you've got the A three hundred eight that now kind of divides Runnymede, it is still a field in which you can close your eyes and imagine what the ceiling of Magna Carta was like. To my knowledge, there had only ever been one attempt to erect a monument um, to, to Magna Carta, um, and that came in seventeen seventy five uh, with this design for a column. Um, for a statue of William III at Runnymede, um, basically to celebrate a uh, hundred years since the um, Glorious Revolution. Uh, and it was really kind of pushed by the, um, the Whigs of the time. Uh, it got off to a good kind of start with the fundraising campaign, um, but, initial, but soon those initial kind of interests dried up um, and it was uh, mothballed basically. Um, and I believe also that part of the reason it was mothballed was that um, this statue was meant to be twice the size of Nelson's column, Runnymede notoriously for the amount of flooding and being a water meadow, it was basically gonna sink, just wasn't feasible. So at the turn of the 20th century, Runnymede formed part of the Crown Estate. Um, but this is not to say that Runnymede was excluded from public usage. From 1770 onwards, for example, Runnymede had been the site of the Egham races and the races were hugely popular and a well attended annual event taking place in September with both the King John plate and Magna Charta plate featuring on the race cards each year. In 1886, the races were cancelled following the Metropolitan's police refusal to supply the necessary men to control the rowdy crowds and the thriving community pickpockets who saw the races as their metaphorical home. Following the cancellation of the races, Runnymede was used for little else other than farming, a situation that remained until after the First World War. In 1920, weighed down by the pressure of war debts, the government looked to reduce public expenditure and increase income to alleviate the economic burden. The selling of crown lands became one way in which the government sought to achieve an income surplus. Hopefully you're beginning to see where this story goes. Acting under the direction of the treasury, the commissioners of woods, forests and land revenues elected to offer for sale by public auction 633 acres of the outlying portion of the Crown's Windsor estate in the parish of Egham. Out of the total acreage that went up for auction, 99 acres covered the Runnymede site. And under the direction of Messrs Daniel Smith Oakley and Gerard, the auction took place at Winchester House on the 6th of July 1921. Runnymede was referred to as Lot 8. It fortunately or unfortunately, probably at the time unfortunately, but fortunately for us now, it received no bids and remained unsold. And in accounting for this, the Daily Telegraph suggested that the site's description as a valuable grazing meadow 
yes, that's right, in 1921, all the Runnymede is is a valuable grazing meadow, meant that potential purchasers remained unaware of the site's extraordinary historic significance. I think the Telegraph have probably got that wrong, but there's definitely definitely the historic significance of the site had been underplayed and it was just seen as little more as a place to graze your cattle. However, the proposed sale did not stay out of the public eye for very long. And by the beginning of August, a campaign to save Runnymede and stop its public auction was well underway. And central to the coordination of this campaign was Helena Normanton, who has conveniently sprung up on the screen. Um, Helena Normanton, notable for many things, but she is the first woman to practice as a barrister in England. Um, and she had first learned of the proposed sale whilst going through a selection of parliamentary papers um, whilst working at the Middle Temple in London. Normanton acted decisively, adopting four approaches to ensure the, world, the word was spread efficiently and effectively. She ensured the major newspapers were aware of the proposal, writing letters to respective editors and through meeting them in person. She engaged with local politicians and the government, making use of the political connections of her father-in-law, Dr. Gavin Brown Clark, who was himself a former Scotch MP. And it was through this link that she was introduced to Charles Wing Carrington, the first Marquess of Lincolnshire, himself a liberal politician and major landowner um, who owned property close to Runnymede. So her third move was to engage the community of Egham, writing to the local rector, Albert Tranter. Here we have on the left, um, Charles Wing Carrington, the first Marquess of Lincolnshire, and then we have um, Albert Tranter, or the Reverend Tranter, on the right hand side. <clears throat> Excuse me. Over the course of the next days, an increasing amount of pressure was applied to the government. On Saturday, the 6th of August, the vicar, that very, uh, you know, that very mild mannered looking chap on the right hand side, um, was joined by other residents at Runnymede, voicing their disdain. Speaking to a reporter from the Daily Mail, Tranter insisted that, and I quote, rather than submit to such vandalism, I should be prepared to go to Gaul if necessary. And after declaring he was prepared to, and I quote, pitch the auctioner into the river, um, Tranter continued, it would be a shame and a scandal if Runnymede became property of a private individual. It was, in his opinion, ought to be national property for all of time, because it was at Runnymede that England's real liberties began. So a flurry of articles on the matter appears in the press. In one such piece published by the Mail, yes, that's right, I'm quoting the Mail, but 100 years ago it wasn't quite, uh, it had a slightly higher editorial standard, shall we say. Um, the author point, pointedly claimed that, that the Crown had decided to dispose of Runnymede. And fortunately, after receiving such criticism, the government reversed their decision to sell Runnymede, announcing their intentions to do this in the House of Commons on the 10th of August. Newspapers were triumphant, publishing numerous articles celebrating the decision over the following days under headlines such as Runnymede retained. However, and I think this is important to stress, Despite this overwhelming sense of positivity um, that came with the decision, some reports continue to emphasize that this did not guarantee the site any long-term security. Normanton was undeniably an in, um, central in ensuring that Runnymede was removed from the public auction. Her actions provided her with a small influential um, uh, network of figures, such as Tranter and the Marquess of Lincolnshire, who each in their own way valued the historic significance of both Runnymede and the Charter. Um, both the Marquess of Lincolnshire and Tranter had publicly stated their desire to see Runnymede retained as national property, but the future of the site remained uncertain, uncertain and this provided a common cause for them to continue their work as a network of allies. However, there was three, there was very little that the three of them could do to immediately change the situation. But being the good people that they were, they remained undeterred. As a collective, their energies shifted away from the itch, issue of purchase and more towards the issue of activity. In the short term, the priority was to ensure that activity at the meadow continued. Collectively, they felt that the more activity that took place on the meadow, the greater chances 
there were of keeping the interest of the world. And this was something that the three could undeniably directly influence. And as such, the Magna Carta Commemoration Committee was established relatively quickly. The Marquess of Lincolnshire appointed as president, Normanton acted as the secretary, with Albert Tranter taking the lead at the very local level. So the first Magna Carta Day service was not held until 1923. We have a picture of it down in the bottom right corner. This booklet from the museum collection is um, of the 1924 um, uh, commemoration service. Unfortunately, very little survives from 1923, definitely within, well, within the museum collection, and I've not seen anything from 23. So this, um, I think, is probably one of the oldest surviving um, commemoration booklets um, dating back to 1924. As detailed in the Times, a procession made up of the massed choirs of the established and free churches of the district marched from St John's Egham, the church at which Tranter was the vicar, um, to Runnymede. And once at Runnymede, the, um, the commemorative service incorporated two keynote addresses that were interspersed by religious liturgy. The first address of 23 was delivered by the very Reverend Sir Albert Victor Bailey, who was the Dean of Windsor. Among other things, he stressed that whilst the Great Charter belonged to the age of feudalism, we were right in looking to it as having been in a remarkable degree the foundation stone in the development of our national liberties. And going back to my point about Magna Carta being a very English document, very much here we have this merger or you know new uh, you know connection of national now being used to represent what i believe to be the united kingdom um and you know uh, i think it's worth making that point that depending at which point you are in history will very really depend on whether magna carta was an english document or whether it's a british document in the sort of early 20s magna carta is a british document you know in a landscape of post uh, Scottish independence and, and referenda, um, Magna Carta is an English document. Um, Lord Lincolnshire delivered the second address in his capacity as president of the society, and he impressed upon the crowd, rather unsurprisingly, the importance of ensuring that that sacred spot, as he said, remained the property of the nation, and with a tone of defiance, reminded those present that the principles established in 1215 were now the keynote of our great empire. Straight from Oliver Dowden, I jest. The Great War, however, had dramatically changed the world's geopolitical landscape. Britain had entered the war as the world's dominant economic force, but its economy had emerged from war beleaguered, weighed down by the sheer expense of total war. Ideas of liberty and justice in their British guises remained an important pillar on which the empire was supported. Selling Runnymede, the site on which these values and ideas were established, only served to strengthen the colony's arguments against the empire's existence. And over the course of the next six years, the Magna Carta Commemoration Society continued to coordinate annual commemorative services at Runnymede. These were far from negligible events, as you can see in the picture. You know, that's a decent sized crowd. Um, for its meeting in of 1925, for example, 2,000 hymn sheets were supplied. In 1929, nearly 5,000 people are said to have attended. But as seemingly the case with local events, success seemingly depended upon the invited speaker. There was near constant disappointment that the committee was unable to secure the services of a first rate celebrity. And the minutes of the uh, Magna Carta Commemoration Committee, which are at Surrey History Centre, you know, detail a long list of names of those that they tried contact. And in 1925, for example, um, the American ambassador um, was contacted, the Lord Chancellor, Lord Cave, Lord Robert Cecil, and Herbert Asquith, um, who was in 1925 Lord Oxford and Asquith, um, were all contacted and declined. Um, with uh, either an apology or an excuse. Um, in 1931, there was briefly some excitement that Sir John Simon, the past and future Home Secretary, had accepted an invitation, only to be dashed when Simon defected from Lloyd George's Liberal Party 
and as a late last minute substitute, um, instead sent to Runnymede was the rather well less known Edward Marjorie Banks, the Conservative MB, MP for Eastbourne. The reluctance of the great and the good to trek out to the Thames can be explained by the way in which the committee too often left it until April or May to approach its celebrity guests. That sounds a bit familiar to me. In each commemorative service, however, the legacy of, of the Charter was situated within a broader socio-political context of that day. For example, in 1924, the Speaker of the House, J.H. Whitley, chose to frame the Charter as the bulwark of British liberty in the face of the Red Menace. His words coming after the establishment of the first Labour government under Ramsay MacDonald and his recognition of the Soviet state and willingness to enter negotiations over an Anglo-Soviet trade treaty. Directly referencing Bolshevism, Whitley stated, dictatorships with queer names, triumvirates with unlimited powers, but, non -limited, but not limited responsibilities, these are offered as substitutes for our liberties. However, talk of the site's permanent purchase were never far from the committee's thoughts. As early as March 1926, the committee was discussing the possibility of saving the site through an approach to the two or three principal owners of the meadows between Cooper's Hill Boathouse and the first bend in the river, wherever that may be. In May that year, it was agreed that such a purchase would require the setting up of a special subcommittee. And over the course of 1926 and 1927, Lord Lincolnshire, Normanter and Tranter played a central role in helping move the issue of purchase um, along, identifying potential buyers, engaging with agents and speaking to various government officials to help progress things. So by the beginning of 1928, the committee had sought out the advice of the National Trust and it was their intention that once the site had been purchased, it would be immediately transferred into their care. Good news was eventually delivered at the commemoration on the 23rd of June, 1929, in front of some 5,000 people. Tranter announced his hope that the site would imminently be saved. And on 18th of December, 1929, it was announced that Lady Fairhaven had purchased all 182 and a half acres of land in Egham beyond Magna Carta Island, as far as the Bells as Oosley with the intention that this be gifted to the National Trust for the benefit of the nation. The 1929 purchase of the Runnymede represented the height of the Magna Carta commemorations activities, and they really struggled to keep up the momentum of the previous decade. Enthusiasm for the commemorative service dwindled as the committee's membership changed and attendance at their meetings dramatically fell. Several members, including Tranter and Mr Ashby, were co-opted onto the National Trust Local Management Committee for Runnymede, dividing their attentions of these two central characters between both the National Trust and the Magna Carta Commemoration Committee. This problem was further compounded following uh, Helena Normanton's decision to establish the Magna Carta Society in 1929, which effectively reduced the Egham Committee's importance and making it part of a much larger, broader project. But in achieving their stated ambition of securing the long-term future of Runnymede, they now lacked the objectives they had for so long, that had for so long legitimized their collective activities. With the future of the site secure, commemorative moments were little more than instances of historical reflection and reconfirmation of the principles embodied within Magna Carta. Before, I would argue, they acted as a vehicle of activism and as a highly public way to push forward cause to make the site the property of the nation. So the last commemorative service happens uh, in 1933 and uh, Leo Amory is persuaded to speak, the former Conservative MP. Amory was in his own right a man of repute, having served as intelligence officer in the First World War before serving in Lloyd George's national government and he helped draft the Balfour Declaration. Amory delivered a passionate address in which he merged ideas and principles embodied with the Charter seamlessly with the case for Indian constitutional reform, which began in 1933 and was partially resolved in 35 uh, with the passing of the Government of India Act, 
and his concern over the rise of the National Socialist Party in Germany. So Amory in 33 manages to talk about Indian social reform on one hand and also the rise of the Nazis effectively in Germany in the same in the same dress. It, it's a it's a fantastic um, it's a fantastic example of the ways in which uh, ideas of liberty um, and Britain's role within the world um, can was used and Magna Carta can be used as a vehicle to explore both um, both both very disparate things in the same moment. Um, so that was Leo Amory, 1933. Um, Amory's speech um, was as much a commentary on the benefits of Western liberalism and an impassioned call to the defence of liberty as it was a reflection on Magna Carta. The Charter, however, provided a historical legitimacy in which he could ground his claims. So the minutes of the Magna Carta commemoration end very abruptly. Um, the last kind of recorded uh, um, meeting is in May 34. It's almost like somebody just forgets to finish them. Um, it's very... 1934 service is completely different in character. Um, and it takes the form of a service of thanksgiving for the pageant. Here we go, Runnymede pageant, which is um, taking place at Runnymede during um, that week of June. So the Right Honourable Lord Hanworth, Master of the Rolls, um, is the speaker that year and by previous addresses delivered at Runnymede, the tone and subject are far less impassioned and politically charged. The pageant committee was chaired by Lainid, Lady Enid Chair and consisted of several, several highly respected residents, predominantly drawn from the aristocracy, and its central purpose was to raise money for various local hospitals and charities. As Lady Enid herself stated, we are all actuated by the knowledge that we are helping to heal hopelessly wrong conditions in a sick world and giving happiness and interest to the united community of our very democratic nation. Interwar Britain, however, was consumed by pageant fever, and many towns and communities staged similar historic reenactments for entertainment, uh, for a greater sense of community involvement, and even informal education. Indeed, it has been argued that this period really witnessed an increased interest in England's medieval past, um, where kind of beliefs that it is within this, medi within this medieval past that England um, was united, um, even going as far as to say that this is the moment in which Britain is created. And the construction of this very particular English past was very much in line with the rhetoric of Stanley Baldwin's One Nation Conservatism. Historical pageantry thus provided a space in which the view of history could be engaged with. The Runnymede pageant of 34 was in keeping with this tradition and locating it on the meadow upon which the charter was sealed served only to heighten expectations and bolster its educational, educational potential. When Lally, the noted theatre producer, was the pageant master who provided a whistle-stop tour of English, heritage, English history in eight scenes, casting over 5,000 residents to play the various roles. And as we can see on the right-hand image, that gives you a kind of idea of the, the amount of people that were running me, both viewing and also in the cast. 5,000 residents to play the various roles, 200 horses and four elephants. But apparently the elephants were withdrawn at the last minute. The Running Mead pageant was advertised as a celebration of English democracy. The ceiling of Magna Carta acted as its centerpiece. In the space of eight days, a total of 14 performances took place, but it really failed to deliver the resounding endorsement of democracy against totalitarianism that some had hoped. Instead, it was a display of the phlegmatic nature of the English, whose strength lay in accommodation between the people, the monarchy and the aristocracy. The omnipresence of the monarchy throughout the pageant was a careful and differential reminder that Magna Carta had not opened and would never open the door to an English republic. The pageant is perhaps an example of the Anderson Nairn account of British history, which saw post-1660 history as a story of accommodation between the monarchy, aristocracy, and bourgeoisie. In fact, the pageant master Gwen Nally 
wished to strengthen the sense of continuity by having members of the aristocracy play their ancestors, such as Nora Lascelles, who played Mary Tudor. Lascelles, the Yorkshire Post reported, when dressed for her part, bears a most striking resemblance to the portrait of Mary, which hangs in Harewood House. It says much for the interest Lally has aroused that she has been able to achieve this so largely. This is not to say that the pageant was not a success and over 14 uh, performances, 90,000 people attended. This figure was made all the more remarkable given the relative distance the site was from its closest towns. Outside London, local newspapers lined up to heap um, praise on the pageant, often before it had even started. The Tamworth Herald, for instance, declared that English interest in Magna Carta will it may be supposed never die, but it is well to be reminded of it as the country was last Saturday. The Times, however, was in equal parts appreciative and condescending, noting that the pageant is most excellent, excellently rehearsed and controlled, through all, though all of the episodes on Saturday, there was never a pause, never a hitch. Every one of the thousand amateur performers knew his, or more generally her place, where to go and where to go next. It also suggested, however, that on the other hand, there was a difficulty in seeing the wood through the trees. The grass was nearly all the time sprinkled with gaily coloured figure, which hardly ever opened up vistas or resolved themselves into masses or groups. That's quite a harsh criticism for the times, I believe. The Guardian, on the other hand, reported that the audience was exuberant and at frequent intervals showed itself delighted by rising to its feet and cheering, though it did note that this was hardly in the spirit of freedom, and instead the audience were cheering at the pompous entry of King John or at Henry VIII, as though his private life actually hadn't um, mattered. But despite a massive attendance of 90,000, that's out of a potential capacity of 105,000, the pageant still made a loss of nearly £500, and this was largely due to the uh, £2,064 charged in entertainment tax that were paid on receipts, which many other large pageants of the era, such as the pageant of Birmingham in 1938, were exempt from. Runnymede, it was judged um, to be not sufficiently educational enough to warrant the exemption many pageants were awarded. In truth, whilst the pageant of 34 represented a zenith of publicity for activity at Runnymede in the 30s, it was merely part of a wider trend within interwar Britain. Beyond the romanticism of its location, it was not the grandiose statement of democratic heritage that some might have yearned. I think really like a key feature of the Runnymede pageant is that this is in our collection, it's it's one that we have a lot of ephemera and um, associated uh, photographs uh, and documents. So, for instance, on the left hand side, we have um, pageant costumes. Um, they are in that picture on display at the British Library's uh, 2015 Magna Carta exhibition. On the right, we have photos. Uh, we have many photos. So here. Uh, we also have the um, uh, rosette, we have an entry ticket. Here is the ceiling of Magna Carta. Here is King John getting dressed on the left and here he is being paraded to the uh, performance arena. I included this because every time I see it, I laugh. But I think it does also demonstrate the point that Magna Carta, although being the centerpiece, you know, there were other scenes from English British history, depending on what, how you want to term it. Um, and they just look to be having a really good time. Um, here we have the ceiling of Magna Carta. Apologies that it's not straight, the image. The image is straight, just the scanning is crooked. Apologies. And this is an, another one of really my favorite images in, in the sense that we both get an insight into what the performance would have looked like from the audience perspective but many of our photographs also give an insight into what it was like to be there so behind the scenes snapshots appear of you know um, performers getting out of caravans having changed and 
and it's those types of things. And, and for anyone that follows us on Twitter, you, you would see that I make great virtue of the fact that some of these images are just a little bit funny. And, and that isn't us necessarily pointing or making fun of, uh, of the subject or, or, or what they're wearing, but it's more just the fact that, you know, behind the scenes, uh, these these images really do kind of capture some some interesting things that you would otherwise not have seen. So moving on from 34, the next our next uh, point of uh, interest um, is then the ABA Memorial in 1957. Unsurprisingly, um, and well, I will explain what's going on in here in a second. So unsurprisingly, commemorative activity at Runnymede is halted during the Second World War. And despite this, the prominence of the Charter as a transatlantic icon of liberal democracy meant that it played a significant role during the conflict and after. And it only really serves to increase ties between Britain and America and really helps to crystallise the special relationship. Um, however, interestingly, it's also between the in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, uh, in 20 years, so between 1945 and 1965, that Runnymede really evolves from being a, a field. Um, I know Runnymede is still a field now, but bear with me. So it goes from a field that has no monuments. Um, between 45 and 65, we have the erection of three major monuments or memorials. And this starts in 1953 with the erection of the Royal Air Forces Memorial on the top of Cooper's Hill. Very much picked um, because of its location and proximity to Runnymede. You only need to refer to Paul H. Scott's poem at the top of the Air Force's memorial overlooking Runnymede. And the fact it says uh, the monument to freedom's winning um, and uh, overlooking the field of freedom's beginning, or, you know, I paraphrase, but words to that effect. We also have 1957, the American Bar Association Memorial. And then you will have 65, the erection of the JFK Monument. Now, unfortunately, because of time, um, I am really only going to be focusing on the ABA Memorial. Um, however, I would highly recommend that you um, go away and, and look into the circumstances, either on the National Trust website, on our website, um, into the intricacies and circumstances that lead to both um, that lead to both the erection of the RAF Memorial and JFK Memorial. So details relating to the RAF Memorial and circumstances surrounding its commission are strangely lacking. Now I've looked in a lot of places and I can't find many things. It's it, I think part of it is the fact that many of the key actors are uh, based in America, um, but even sort of going to the Weaver archives um, and looking at Sir Edward Moff, who's the architect of the ABA Memorial, um, there's nothing uh, beyond like a couple of, um, beyond a couple of details or sketches relating to this monument. So um, what, what you're about to hear is, is pieced together through very fragmentary evidence, but interesting nonetheless. So talks relating to the erection of a memorial at Runnymede begin in earnest in August 1956 in Dallas, Texas at the meeting of the administration committee of the American Bar Association. And the committee's main discussion point is the upcoming annual meeting, uh, which also conveniently happens to be their 80th anniversary meeting. And as such, because of it, it being a very, very um, important meeting, the, um, the locations for the meeting are split between New York and London. Um, part of these discussions, and attentions turned how to that they might commemorate Magna Carta whilst in London. And it's generally agreed that they devote all their efforts to do everything necessary to secure a place suitable, mon um, secure a place suitable enough for a monument at Runnymede commemorating the interest of um, the American Bar Association in Magna Carta, including the solicitation of funds from lawyers for this purpose. So even in 1956, they're already going out with the intention of building monument at Runnymede um, and they're going to essentially finance it. The ABA's desire to see a memorial erected at Runnymede um, dovetails quite conveniently um, with conversations that are happening in Surrey. Um, 1956 um, sees a move to establish a Magna Carta Trust 
which we can only assume is the successor to the Magna Carta Commemoration Committee of the interwar years. And these discussions and political manoeuvrings provide the backdrop to the 741st anniversary celebration. So the ABA are willing to provide the monument as a gift to the British people, um, something which was enthusiastically welcomed by the representatives of the Urban District Council of Egham. Runnymede had remained without a monument to Magna Carta for almost 750 years by this point. And as was discussed um, earlier, that some kind of almost believed, or many people had by this point sort of believed that actually Runnymede itself, perhaps the best um, memorial to Magna Carta was the fact that Runnymede remained untouched, a bit like a, you know, a bit like a, a battlefield and the fact that it hadn't changed. And that's the best way in which you know, Magna Carta can be commemorated by the fact that actually we, we just leave it as it as it was. Um, so it was um, noted by those in England that the acceptance of a gift from American lawyers represented a unique departure from um, past policy and a uh, most unusual action. The ABA, however, um, were interested far more than simply commemorating the charter and the wider values and legal principles it represented. It was felt that a monument at Runnymede would generate an immense level of publicity and international attention, and the erection of this monument served as a political statement as much as anything else. Against the backdrop of increasing Cold War tensions and the clash of political and legal traditions, the Magna Carta monument was a beacon of hope, representing the pinnacle of Western liberal values as the ABA themselves acknowledge, the erection of a monument would serve to dramatize the fundamental difference between our system of government and its recognition of individual rights and the system of our chief competitors in the international field whose system denies such rights in favor of an all powerful state. Magna Carta had thus been drawn into the Cold War and Runnymede was to be used to be the site at which the ideas of freedom, democracy and the rule of law would be internationally projected. Against the backdrop of the Cold War, the Charter and Runnymede acted as both a guardian against the tyranny of oppression of the East and an inspiration for those forced to live under these regimes. The ABA were encouraged to approach Sir Edward Moff to produce a design for the monument. It was, in their opinion, um, Moff who was well placed to make suitable suggestions as to the proper type of monument. And following a successful completion, um, following the successful completion of the RAF memorial, Moff's design was simple: uh, a neoclassical rotunda supported by eight pillars, housing a central pedestal made of Portland stone. The monument was to be raised, um, and the associated landscaping improvements would ensure that visitors would have to climb steps on their approach. The estimated cost of the, the of, mon of the monument would be no more than eleven thousand pounds divided into three sums, 6,000 for the monument itself, 4,000 for the landscaping, and 1,000 for the architectural fees. And so it is under the cover of a thick blanket of clouds um, that the optimistic spirit of hope and liberty was undeterred um, on the afternoon of Sunday, the 28th of July, 1957. In front of an audience of approximately 5,000 people, as you can see in this photo, um, the American Bar Association's monument was unveiled. Um, interestingly, the seating before the un official unveiling, the monument is covered in two flags, the American flag and also the Union Jack. And I think that really symbolizes that special relationship. So there were four um, central speeches that were delivered as part of the um, as part of the unveiling, um, and they kind of emphasise two two key points. The first point is that America and and Britain, England, um, share the same democratic heritage. So, um, Mr. Gambrell, who was from the American Bar Association. Um, I believe he is the, he was the immediate past president. So he was the one that initiated the mon monument. Um, he opens the proceedings by claiming they were gathered on hallowed ground. He says, we sense again the bond that unites the dead, the living and those unborn. 
and the internal quest for freedom. The principles enshrined within the charter were framed as transcending time. Its truths are universal and eternal, good for all men for all time. Beyond this, however, the charter was styled as an important tenet of the cultural heritage that linked America and Britain. And I quote, there flows within our veins a common bloodline, commingling Celt and Saxon, Dane and Norman, Pict and Scot. We share a tongue and are enriched by a common culture, but the genius of our concord is something more. What was brought into being on this meadow holds us still together. From that we trace our brotherhood. <clears throat> and um, Gambrel was followed by, uh, he is followed by Lord Evershed, who basically echoes very similar sentiments. The next two speakers are Charles Ryan, who is the president of the ABA at the time, and then Sir Hartley Shawcross, who um, is president, who is representing the British legal tradition. And their words are particularly striking because they really set this within the context of the Cold War. Ryan proudly declares that the mere mention of Magna Carta stirs the Anglo-American pulse like a battle cry against oppression and tyranny communism being the latest uh, opponent that attempt to um, undermine its principles. So Hartley um, Shawcross, in a very similar way, says very similar words, um, reasserting that in the end, the individual will transcend the state, referencing sort of 1950, uh, 1957 Hungarian uprising. So that's really the... Uh, you know, some of the stories that surround the ABA memorial, um, and by far there, there are far more, um, you know, intricacies and um, intricacies in, in the words that they're using, um, both to also underline, but well, both to underline the Anglo-British connection, but also to underline this idea of Western democracy versus Eastern totalitarianism. Um, so that kind of very briefly gives you an idea of why, uh, hopefully, um, and explains why um, there is an American monument at Runnymede to Magna Carta. So we're going to have to do some um, fast forwarding through time here, and we're going to go now to 2015. Um, and the rest of this talk will be very, very quick. So Magna Carta 2015, a massive moment, six Yes, six years ago now, Ooh, how time flies. Um, I think it's interesting to say that in 1965, um, there isn't any national celebration at Runnymede. Um, that's strange. Most of the events that do take place, uh, take place in the city of London. Um, and part of that is the way in which the Magna Carta um, Trust uh, kind of has a rotation um, or a triennial rotation of uh, events um, circulating in various charter towns, and it just so happened that 65 was the um, was the time in which things would be hosted by the City of London. But that is not to say that nothing takes place at Runnymede in 65. Um, in fact, there is a very 19 appropriate 1960s um, uh, event that does take place on the 15th of June. Uh, 15th of June 1965, Runnymede is transformed into a 96 into a 1960s medieval inspired burlesque type pageant in which you have um, you have belly dancers, you have scantily clad women um, walking around in high hills at Runnymede delivering beer to um, the, to the public. You have uh, performers. It's basically the Sweden 60s kind of, you know, in this, uh, uh, under this kind of pretense of celebrating medieval history. Um, however, very little records remain, um, unfortunately. Uh, everything that I've kind of taken or explained to you um, there is from, um, is from the local Egham newspapers to which I would recommend take coming to uh, the museum because we have a wonderful and extensive collection of local newspapers and some of the things they they report on in 65 are hilarious. <laughs> so Monday the 15th of June uh, you've got David Cameron 
standing on the um, standing on the stage um, in front of very similar 5,000 guests, um, very similar to 1957. International mixture of people. So you've got Americans and you have Brits. Obviously, you've got politicians and key figures, uh, invite only. Um, I love this quote from the famous or from the leading Magna Carta scholar, Nicholas Vincent. He says, Runnymede was a wonderful English combination of village fate and fascist flag rally. So the ceremony itself is notable only really for the fact that the Prime Minister, David Cameron, attempts to subvert the meaning of the ceremony and inspire confidence in the conservative dream of a new British Bill of Rights and to end the uneasy relationship with Europe and in particular its human rights acts. This is pre-Brexit, of course. Um, we know where that goes. He finishes his speech with a rousing challenge. He says, it falls to us in this generation to restore the reputation of those rights and their critical underpinning of our legal system. He was widely attacked by the political left in the immediate days afterwards for hijacking history. Interestingly, however, you've got, you've got Cameron on stage delivering a very, you know, hijacking history using Magna Carta to kind of push this conservative dream. Uh, or reality, or, or even a dream of a certain wing of the Conservative Party and appeasing those people. Um, here are a couple of images from the um, for the Magna Carta ceremony. This is the re re uh, appro no, like reaffirmation, re recommitment to of the ABA mo monument. So you've got Brits and the ABA professions there. But you've got Cameron saying that and. At the same moment, you have Hugh Locke unveiling the Jurors artwork. Now, the Jurors is a wonderful um, art installation, and I would, unfortunately, I can't tell you much about it in the uh, for the for the benefit of this talk. Um, so, I would thoroughly recommend that you go onto the National Trust website because um, they have a very extensive um, resource section relating to um, the Jurors. But I think the point I would like to make is the fact that. Cameron's appropriating Magna Carta, whilst at the same time you have um, Hugh Locke, a very um, politically engaged um, uh, artist of um, Afro-Caribbean descent, um, who's using the memory and legacy of Magna Carta and taking that in a very world kind of world history perspective. So he's seeing rights and um, the evolution of rights in, in its totality and entirety from a world perspective. So Magna Carta is just one moment, but there are also moments relating to, you know, Chinese history, moments relating to Indian history, etc. Um, and here at the bottom, we have um, Prince William looking rather uncomfortable being involved in the official un like unveiling of the jurors' artwork. Locke's um, jurors is basically 12 chairs. Uh, the 12 chairs remain empty. Well, the 12 chairs are empty. Um, they uh, seem to be awaiting gathering a discussion or debate of some kind. They act as an open invitation from the artist for the audience to sit, to reflect, and to discuss together the implications of the histories and issues depicted. And on the back and the front of each of um, of the back on the front of each of uh, Locke's um, chairs, he uses them as kind of uh, ca separate canvases to, to depict um, very intricately and um, lovingly, actually, uh, various moments. Um, and these are really designed to be springboards for discussion about the evolution of rights, et cetera. But I would like to finish with, um, well, basically where we started, uh, Egger Museum. Um, Egger Museum, also played a part in uh, the 2015 commemorations. Um, we spent a lot of time talking about high politics and, and we started in the 1920s with local activism. And I suppose 2015 is, is Egham's, e Egham Museum uh, local activism. Um, so Egham Museum in 2015 uh, is very fortunate in the fact that it was awarded a, a sort of just under a hundred grand from the Heritage Lottery Fund. Um, to deliver a wide ranging suite of resources um, and outreach workshops um, all around this idea of, um, of Magna Carta celebrating its legacy. 
Um, for instance, here we have, you know, this was quite a quite a quite a triumph for us to have our artwork in the local Waitrose. Um, that is, believe it or not, some of the hardest space to get your your work up. Um, we also managed to use uh, some shops, some shop fronts on the left, and uh, put our banners in there. And on the right hand side, in Staines, the um, shopping centre was adorned with um, Egger Museum's banners. But probably the the central piece of our commemoration was the icon and inspiration exhibition that um, that was in the local church uh, between June and August of 2015. And it really comes back to this idea of intangible heritage. You know, some of the key issues for us were, were how do you put on a, a Magna Carta exhibition that, where you don't have an original copy of the 1215 charter? Um, so if you look closely, that kind of S banner at the back is 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 a copy of Magna Carta and underneath is a word cloud drawing out some of the key words in the 1215 charter. And that's really designed to emphasize this point that 1215 Magna Carta is not about liberty, it's not about freedom, it's about you know the minutiae of 13th century politics. Um, and then in kind of that central spine you have that kind of very, uh, uh, not romanticized, but a, in the highlights, the Magna Carta moments, uh, to quote uh, Justin Champion, um, of which Magna Carta, you know, was invoked um, throughout English or, or British history. But I think one of the, um, you know, successful and, and the reason that it was successful was actually that, um, and I think this is something that we can all think about, regardless of where you are or which institution you come from, is that actually this type of work is great but this type of work only really matters if you're doing it generally uh, uh, genuinely in a collaborative way and in a way that involves the community and we did that um so the central part of our exhibition was curated um here we have uh here we have a running mead pageant costume in our exhibition and on the right we have we have the uh, storming of the city of London out of Lego, one of the more popular elements. Um, but going back to this idea that actually a, a key part was involving the local community. Um, so on the bottom right there, you see us, we linked up with the local Runnymede Art Society and asked them to sort of depict what Magna Carta meant to them in terms of, uh, in terms of legacy and, and, and their artwork was, you know, formed a kind of perimeter to our exhibition. These pennants behind us, we had over 12 pennants made by local various groups, again, working together to capture the spirit of 1215 and, and commemorate it in a way that they felt was um, that they felt was appropriate. Um, so our project had numerous kind of outputs. It had the exhibition, it had the community banners. Some of those banners ended up at Runnymede. Or, um, at the national and international commemoration. Um, we also have our Magna Carta microsite, which is full of a plethora of online resources. And many of the our resources, unsurprisingly, draw quite heavily on our uh, kind of archive, uh, the archive of information that we have and look after and care for. Um, so I, I think the point I'm trying to make is that much like this event, um, Magna Carta is, you know, a central moment uh, for for many people um, in Britain. In Egham, because of our proximity, it's always going to hold and retain a special place in our heart. Uh, Egham Museum might not be the biggest institution in the world, but due to uh, its proximity to Runnymede, uh, we have a fantastic array of um, archives and I hope that throughout the course of this um, talk I've been able to show you some of our resources, some of the things that we look after and and sort of, sort of think about ways in which we might use them to tell a story that's a hundred year story of uh, Running Mead. Uh, as I said there are plenty of memorials that I haven't spoken about. I didn't speak about the RAF memorial, I didn't speak about the JFK memorial, um, I didn't speak really in much depth about Hugh Locke's um, artwork, 
I didn't even mention Mark Wallinger's Written Water. Um, so there are a plethora of uh, things that you can explore and that are still to be explored um, by yourself. Uh, and we would encourage you in a post-pandemic landscape um, to both visit the site um, and also come to our uh, museum to see some of the material um, that I've referenced and more in person. Um, so I will finish with one more point. Um, probably at the, at the moment, if there's one criticism that could be levied against Runnymede as a site of history, it's that it lacks any real historical interpretation. Uh, the landscape is currently defined by the physical presence its various monuments, memorials and artworks. Each engages with a same part of aspect of the child's history and legacy and reflects the palimpsestic nature of memory, so layers of memory. However, without the context narrative surrounding each and a framework within which these successive interpretations and representations can be traced and understood, they risk becoming almost meaningless and intangible. And the National Trust's Runnymede Explored project is really seeking to improve the site's interpretation um, and us at Egger Museum are really keen to support that project as best we can. But I hope as I've demonstrated that the history of commemoration at Runnymede is very comple complex and indeed very dense. To really make sense of it, you need to know and have a fundamental grasp and understanding of 20th century world history and politics need to appreciate individual actors and groups, as well as contemporary circumstance, that have ensured commemorative activity has continued at Runnymede. Although by no means has this been constant, monumental landscapes reflect local and national interests, articulating political positions and projecting cultural associations. In this regard, the landscape of Runnymede provides the perfect canvas upon which to illustrate ideas of liberty and democracy through the erection of monuments and memorials. Thank you very much.